you go through James, which is just a unique opportunity to have a professor who is part of our team as well. Um, just to introduce myself, I know some of you, Carrie, I think we've connected before and, um, you know, I, I've been teaching at Azusa Pacific University for pretty close to 20 years now in an entry level DPT program. Um, I teach primarily the orthopedic segment, even though in my early years I taught just about everything, which is, you know, how, how the junior faculty always end up in seven different classes somehow. Um, and uh, PhysioU is, is more about figuring out how to solve things that I just could not figure out how to solve as an educator over 20 years. Why is it that my students could not understand the skills and could not figure out when to apply them? This was a major question I had. Why is it that students could not connect the dots between what I taught them in orthopedics and what they learned in therapeutic exercises? There's just this, all these major disconnects that I couldn't figure out. So building these apps and these simulations is really just a journey of an educator trying to figure out new tools to solve these different problems. So I, I'm excited to share this with you today. And I, I think um, the, the vast majority of people who came by our booth at CSM are faculty and students saying, this has transformed my learning and my teaching so much. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you to share a little bit about that. Guys, this is a small group. The moment you have questions or thoughts, please feel free to chat it in or just unmute yourself. Um, raise your hand and, and James will usually stop me. Um, and I'd love to be able to have this as a conversation as well. I'm always curious about how faculty are thinking, what they are trying and what physio you can do to help make that a reality or can help to implement those ideas better. So the first thing I was gonna say is, there were a few key questions we were talking about. So myself, Chris Patterson actually teaches this class, Range of Motion MMT. And Chris is very particular to hand holds, hand placement. Mm -hmm. So Dan Farwell, the, the, my wingman in orthopedics who we actually filmed the app on, we have refilmed this app multiple times to try to clean it up, to try to make sure we hit alternative different hand positions based on different textbooks. So I think what you'll see is that most likely the handholds or positioning that you expect to see are all within this app. We tried really hard to try to figure out a standardized, simple and logical way. But in reality, schools use multiple different types of textbooks. textbooks. So we've generally filmed alternative positions for a lot of the grade, grade one and two type, um, type MMTs, for example. So that first question that I, that Chris and I were asking ourselves is, is teaching motor skills a one and done experience? Is it that students have no idea what they're coming to lab for, we show it once in front of class, and then we hope that they've learned it, they've integrated it, and they're ready for practicals towards the end of the semester. This is, ex this is magnified a thousand times over when you think about any orthopedic class, special test, posture and range of motion, all of these integrated skills, interventions, all of that taught in one lab with the hopes that there is one mastery of the skill and then integration, clinical reasoning developed in it. So Chris and I thought, and Dan, we basically said, why don't we film all of the skills so that students can preview them before lab? They come prepared. They come even having tried some of them out, even going through it on their own. So that when I come to show these techniques in class, it's their second exposure, at minimum second exposure. And then when they go back to practice with their friends, all of these videos are nicely organized in the app, which I'll tell you as they go out into the clinic, Carrie, as you're mentioning, they're going out into the clinic, the students are like, I'm so glad these videos are all there in my pocket. So I think if you think about deep learning, deep learning is not an instant. Deep learning is spread over a long period of time so that mistakes can be made, repetition, right? We know repetition is part of learning. All of that, I think, philosophically must change the way that we teach. Uh, I mean, this, our, our entire profession is built around motor skills first and then development of the clinical reasoning. Or perhaps, really, philosophically, I think the clinical reasoning should be developed first and then the motor skills become the tools that you leverage using your clinical reasoning. The other thing I would say, so the other thing I would say is how can I enhance 
application and develop early clinical reasoning in some of these early classes. So we know that range of motion MMT is a first semester class, typically. Um, that means that there isn't a ton of background knowledge related to pathophysiology or conditions, but I think it would be, we would be remiss of us to not introduce common conditions, introduce common impairments that make all of these skills relevant from a clinical context. I always talk to faculty and share about this idea that I think all the basic didactic information we ever deliver deserves a half step further, meaning case studies of some sort, some type of clinical scenario, even if the information is pared down, even if the story and the application of the skill is simplified. I think what it does is it allows the student to now take a clinical scenario, a apply a recently, known, recently learned skill, and then enjoy that I got it right feeling because it builds confidence on top of the knowledge that we are delivering. And I believe that that type of pathway to learning, meaning the half step, should technically occur on a weekly basis. I don't think it's ideal that we run through the entire upper quarter of range of motion MMT, and then we do case studies at the end in preparation for the finals. I think case studies should be applied on a weekly basis as they unpack material, apply material. And once that synthesis is occurring, I think it makes learning of the next set of skills even more, more um, efficient and uh, deeper. So let me go first into the Range of Motion MMT app. So I'm gonna cut out of this presentation for a second. Before I do that, Anybody have any thoughts about what I just said? Any, any reflections as you've been teaching about some of the challenges you're seeing in either motor skill development or the application of these motor skills? Any thoughts about that? Um, hi, this is Lori. Hi, Lori. I, I actually have just started um, with this new cohort and actually doing that. And I, and I do use um, PhysioU to enhance it. But um, I, I definitely have them work together in groups like before they come to class on whatever this, the weeks or the day's lecture is about. And then I integrate them actually doing the actual physical movement of what they need to do for the, each class. And I'm not, this is not just for range of motion. This is even just for like have rehab and advanced have rehab, all the other courses so that they get a feel that they can actually work out you know, well, this patient has osteoporosis and this patient is 70 years old or this patient has osteoporosis and, you know, they're older or this patient is younger and they broke a leg. What, what would you do with things like that? So simple, simple, um, simple impairments for them to be able to have a clinical judgment about um, how they would, you know, approach the patient for whatever it is we're asking them to do. And I think PhysioU enhances it so much. My students love it. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Hey, this is Matthew. Um, Hi, Matthew. Really enjoyed the, uh, the comments that you made about the challenges of teaching these skills, showing them one time, but more importantly, helping them with clinical reasoning. Yes. So I, I've kind of had a chance to look at some of the um, demonstrations of the uh, special tests and joint mobilizations and different things, which I also teach, and I really like those. I was wondering if you had thought about um, ways of helping to record um, little vignettes, or maybe there's something in the library that helps with clinical reasoning, because I feel like that's such a hard thing to teach, especially to um, young students, and just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yes. You will see that this entire year, PhysioU has been going nuts building e-learning. E-learning is my attempt to create simple, some are simple, some are complex. The bulk of them are simple because I keep thinking about this half step. If you take a student all the way deep into the weeds of clinical reasoning, they, their brains are exhausted, they hit too many roadblocks and they quit. So the first layer that, that I think students need to do is they play through simple games that they can claim victory, that they can apply their knowledge. They're like, yes, I knew it. And then over time, we scale the games up in complexity. 
So I'm going to get to that, um, Matthew, in a second. I'll show you how we're using these sims. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how uh, you'll see infused even in the apps, how I'm teasing out their learning. I'm like stretching every little piece of learning to connect to anatomy, to connect to function, to connect to the patient scenario. So, so hold on just for a sec. I'll show you that in, in just a second, but I think it's a great point. Today, our student learners deserve more than just being taught techniques. They deserve your expertise as a clinician. And these tools are built to give you space, right? You don't have to be worried about demonstrating every single technique. The app can do that quite nicely. You add in all the clinical reasoning components. It's why you spent all these years as a clinician is to be able to create the narrative in which all of these isolated skills live. So I'll show you what I mean. It's a great, it's a great comment. So when you go to PhysioU to log in, and for those of you who don't have faculty access yet, please feel free to go to the educator physical therapy faculty. There's a way to sign up, get free educator access. All faculty have full access. This is our gift as educators to share with our own colleagues because we know how much, how much burden we are facing today. There's, it's just no question about that. So when you sign in, you'll see that there's a collection of apps. We continue to grow the collection of apps. I just easily sort them by fundamental skills here. And you'll see here's the range of motion MMT, surface anatomy, palpation, physical agents, gait, assisted devices. So I'm gonna click into range of motion MMT. And I want you to see that we have organized this. Range of motion MMT is one of the easiest apps to build. And yet it is also one of our most popular apps because it's fairly generic how all of us teach this class. So if you go to shoulder, for example, you will see basic palpation skills. We put this here. This is actually the fundamental palpation skills. There's bony landmarks. We've organized it by body region. These are all things that students can do asynchronously on your own. So as we know, lab time is somewhat compressed. All of these videos related to palpation, the students are, have a lab handout and they just practice this on their own because we, we know that they need these landmarks for the range of motion and MMT section. When palpating for the coracoid process, the coracoid process is an attachment for the pectoralis muscles. So the best way to palpate is to horizontally adduct the patient so as to put those structures on slack. In this position, I can use two fingers and I can palpate deep into this region, feeling a bony prominence come out in that degree as I put the muscles on slack. So what you'll see is there is a brief description of the location, the purpose perhaps to identify reproduction of symptoms, the cues on how to do it, some associated structures, maybe some associated pathology. So again, there's a little bit of a stretch there. We're trying to get them to think about it. And even if they don't know exactly what all of this means yet, I'm gonna put a bookmark in their brain. It allows me to stretch their brain a little bit. So that's what palpation is like. And palpation goes from bony to also soft tissue. So you have all of these different scapular structures. And if you're done with, for example, when we're done with palpation, the students know for shoulder week, their job is to preview all of these techniques once. And by the way, we've created a lab handout that we have shared with all of you. Everything in PhysioU is hyperlinked and described in this generic lab handout that you can use if you want. So if we go to range of motion, you'll see that there is a end feel description. Here is the video of flexion. With the patient lying supine here on the table, we can now measure for shoulder flexion. In shoulder flexion, let's go over a few of our landmarks. We're looking at the greater tubercle, the humerus. That's going to be our axis. Our moving arm will actually go down to the lateral epicondyle here at the elbow. As the patient moves into flexion, I'm going to stabilize through the rib cage here and stabilize the thorax so that we do not get any contributing motion. 
and we can focus right at the shoulder. As the patient goes through that full range, I've been able to stabilize here. There's my axis of movement. There's my moving arm. And from here, the stationary arm will be the parallel right along here to the mid axillary line of the thorax. So here uh, he applies the goniometer. You can see that there's instructions. If a patient cannot tolerate supine, there are some alternate positions. So let me click on that. And then if you close that back up, here is stabilization, the testing motion, normal end feel, goniometer landmarks, and some normal ranges from a few various sources. Dan has also made a point to put down some keys to reliability. So he, I think he's been a clinician for over 30 years. And so he's, he adds a few comments here on how to make sure that this test is done um, or modifications you might have to make depending on the patient type. So there's keys to reliability throughout the app. The other thing that I think is really useful is how we try to connect that isolated you know, assessment of range of motion to some form of function or occupation. So if you think about like, why would a patient come to you? What are they telling you they can't do that drives your decision to assess this or to, or to improve this movement? And so you have an image and then you have some potential things that people do. I think what that does is again, it stretches their thinking. Instead of saying, well, we'll get to that. You'll figure that out when you get to the clinic. In the moment when they're learning the skill, I will ask them, what kind of things do they do in life that require shoulder flexion that you would eventually want to measure this range of motion to see if it's impaired? That critical question is the development of clinical reasoning. It's the, it's the elements of the purpose of why we do these skills. So you can see we've thought about a lot of these things because I just feel like we can't afford to leave this learning moment without having created a bridge created a bookmark in their mind. Any comments about that before I move on to MMT? Any thoughts, questions? This is Carrie and I've, we've Carrie. been utilizing this um, in the PTA program pretty much from, from the get-go and then utilizing it in the PT program as well and the addition of the function occupation has been great like just to bring that up so again i can utilize that we'll talk about it specifically about some things um, but again time being short being like oh here let me show this to you and be able to um, give them that idea but they're starting starting to think about that um, as well so that's anything that they can relate back to i mean again it, i always tell about it being able to stick they need some kind of skeleton to stick it to um, yes. and not just be learning all the facts. And I think that's, that's the, they, they're interested, um, which is somewhat easy to find range of motion and manual muscle testing because they all want to figure out on themselves like, so they can make that connection, but definitely having the function occupation um, and whichever the SpongeBob, I don't know where the SpongeBob was, but people, yeah. or the minion, I think it was the minions. Um, they thought that was yeah. <laughs> the union in something. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Those little things help too. So. Those little things help too, right? It doesn't, why is everything so serious is what my kids always ask me as I rip the iPads out of their hands. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it's um, totally agree. Any, any other comments? Thank you for that, Carrie. No, I think Mike, the take home message that you start here is that, you know, this found, this is a very basic foundational application. Is there variation? Yes, there is a different way. How do you do muscle testing in this format versus say uh, a, a bedridden patient, you know, or home health patient. And, and that is, so that's where the teacher, the instructor comes in and shows, you know, you're gonna do shreyas anterior, but they can't lie, you know, supine, you gotta do it upright. So how's that change with her? So that's where the clinical application comes in and the pearls that you bring as a clinician yourself as the instructor can share with the student. Right. And I'm just clicking through here just for a sec, because I want you to see that when it comes to even cervical spine range of motion, we have filmed all the different versions for you. Think about what a relief that is. I mean, I always think I'm like, thank goodness I have these videos because now I can always count on a backup. If there's a moment where 
where I'm like, I'm not, I just can't remember something. I just pull up the video and then I piggyback on it. I mean, that's a huge relief. If you think about, I just recently did the shoulder lab. How many gazillion special tests that I rarely do in the clinic? Well, they're all filmed, they're filmed well, and I can piggyback on some of them. And, you know, it's, it's just these little things sometimes just buys you a little bit of breathing space for you to breathe, for your brain to think, for you to assess how the class is doing, and for you to slow everything down for us as faculty who are always, right, when you're in the spotlight on the stage, it's really hard to assess what's going on with the learning because we're worried about the next technique. Here, you always have backup. Yep. I always tell the, I always tell students too, I go, don't ever go to a clinical rotation and say, well, Dr. Sims didn't show us that way. And then they try to tell their CI that they're wrong. You know, it's a way to do it. Learn what the CI teaches you and then put that in your repertoire of you may use it five years from now or something, but it's not right, wrong. It's just different. Right. So when you look at MMT, what you'll see is we've already begun to do the little stretch. Here's the connection to what you're learning in anatomy. And we've organized the grades here, zero through two, three through five. And as you look through, there's the patient position, therapist position, stabilization, the cues and the grading key muscles, keys to reliability, and some occupation and function comments. So these, this part of the, the app, actually, Chris is very particular. We've gone through and refilmed a lot of these because Dan, being a 30-year veteran, had a lot of different little ways that he liked to do it. We have just stuck directly to the textbook. Um, in general, we, we kind of benchmark Berryman Reese, which was the textbook we were using. We recently just filmed a whole round of Kendall um, techniques and have added those in. So, and then there's various alternative positions depending on certain faculty who have reached out to us who said, hey, in the textbook I use, we don't do this in sideline, we do this in supine or something like this. Those we have filmed alternate positions for MMT. You should be able to find anything you need for these basic MMT te techniques. Okay, and then let me move into uh, the neuro screen. The neuro screen is part of this class. It is taught as a fundamental skill. We were beginning to hear from students that we learned it one way in clinical skills one. Dr. Wong teaches, uh, teaches it a different way in ortho, in ortho, and then we learn a third different way to learn, do it in neuro. So this was becoming a problem in our program. The entire program decided that we were going to standardize to the Asia, Asia dermatome myotome assessment. So what you have now is upper quarter dermatomes, myotomes, and reflexes available for you. We, as a program, have just agreed to standardize to that. Students are much happier. So something to think about as well. One of the reasons why we, the, the apps are so helpful, helpful to us, even in the pandemic, particularly in pandemic, when we broke up into all these little pods, I had instructors everywhere and instructors all wanted to show their cool little tricks. I pulled all the instructors together and said, guys, I value all the cool little tricks you have, but it works against student confidence in the instructors when we're all doing something a little different. So we are going to standardize how we test them, how we train them using the PhysioU videos. I think there's something important there for, for each of us to consider. Like variations in practice create chaos. There's no question about it. Ortho is a fantastic example of that. Every clinician has their secret little way to mob this and that. We don't teach it. We teach one way, the way, because they can learn all the variations later. Any comments about that? Any thoughts? Any reflections about that same experience? I can say for us that it's been, that's the one thing that the students get really frustrated with um, is having all of the different things. And I can tell you as well, like switching from, we were, had, a, had a lot of control because there's just three of us teaching in the PTA program able to to pretty much contain that 
Um, we've tried, we learned that a long time ago to get very standardized. This is what you need, what you need to follow. And then I went in and taught in the PT department and you're getting different. And we also have um, some of our first year uh, profile, well, they teach throughout, but some of them are not um, PT by, they're not PTs. Um, so they're utilizing other things. So being able to come in and standardize in, um, that's one of the things that we've really found. Like, what are we, let's standardize. I mean, even just um, your abnormal blood, um, standardize, trying to get that back and that. And that's one of the things that I think really is um, helpful for the students because it brings down their stress and anxiety because they're trying to learn dermatomes, myotomes, um, we'll have to learn it for this way in one person's class. And so being aware of that, I know that the, the PT department is very much aware of that um, and us being able to get more standardized and then getting back to the keep it simple um, and always reverting back. And that's one of the things that, that is nice is what is entry level? What do we need to, what do we need? Do they need entry level? Like the students crave like the cool Instagram stuff. Like they want to see the the crazy. Let's let's get them on a Bosu ball with one thing and throw a ball and be you know. But they need to they need the foundation right now, and we need to get the foundation and and remember and what's the what's the need to know, um, what's the nice to know, and then we're we just there's too much there's too much bloat. Um, and we've got to figure out. And, and so that's the one thing that's really nice about the potential of having the physio U is you can go back and I, we, will, we will in the PTA program be, these are what we're utilizing. This is, this is the standard. This is what we're going to test you on. And that's throughout. Right. Uh, and so that's a nice thing to have the, to be able to go throughout the, the course because we were trying to do that before with multiple, you know, you have multiple different books and we're like, remember that book from first semester, you need to keep that because that's the standard. So it's nice. Now we have the physio U, this is a standard. That's what we're, we're going to test you on um, as well. And then the other thing, having the different variations in the manual muscle testing and goniometry, I think is also important to introduce for the clinical decision-making as well for them to realize, okay, guess what? It, it you know, the classic, it depends. Um, the answer for everything is it depends in PT. Um, and so for them to start to be aware, cause they have been so like, there's one answer and it's like, no, there's not one answer. There is a spectrum on just about everything. There's more than one way to do things. Um, right. Starting to introduce that, those variations, but realize that we have the standard. You're gonna transfer somebody a little bit different than than me, I'm going to transfer these two different patients differently um, based on their body size, based on what's going on with me. Um, and so getting, getting that um, and starting to introduce that uncertainty, because I think that that's automatically getting them to do that clinical decision making um, as well. So, and it's, and it's difficult for them. And I can, again, tell you from teaching PTA students and PT, the first year PT students are very similar. That was one of the big yeah. surprises to me. This, there's really, especially with manual muscle testing, goniometry, um, there is really not much difference nope. uh, between teaching that. And, and I know our OT and OTA programs, actually, they teach their, their classes together. Um, so which is a nice, because then you start getting some of that standardization um, intra-professionally too, between the, the OT and the OTAs, then they split off for other little things. But um, that, is, that is something that, that also, because we, we need to get more standardized. And so potentially also with having Physio U, if multiple, multiple programs are utilizing Physio U, then we're getting a little bit more into that what is our norms, what is our standardization across, um, across and across the across um, the world actually with it being able to do that. But even even now I know East Coast, my sister practices West Coast and there's some nice variations between East Coast and West Coast. And then you got Midwest with Chicago being too. So I think that's that's an important thing to be able to introduce that. Perfect. Mike, there's a, a, a question in chat that's very applicable. Matt asks, uh, what, what standard text or, or uh, information you use for the ortho stuff, special yeah. test? Uh, McGee versus Keltenborn. I An old guy like me, we had Hoppenfeld way back then. Yep. So what's the answer so to that? I would just say that the guideline, the clinical practice guidelines is, is what it's built on. And we have generally 
try to use labels that are purely logical and mainstream practice. So you'll see very little specific terminology that is tied to any particular genre, say, genre, genre or philosophy. It is all of our orthopedic apps because of our partnership with JSPT is completely guideline based. And, and it is an evolving conversation. I mean, ortho is a very messy topic, um, but you will see that instead of saying McKenzie's repeated extension, we just call it repeated extension, repeated movements to centralize leg pain. Or when we talk about um, excessive movements where Shirley Sarman would say that is a flexion syndrome, we just call it excessive flexion of the lumbar spine. That's what you wanna look out for. And here are some movement tests to do that. And so I would say that what you can count on from PhysioU um, is that we are trying really hard to clean up what the mess that we, it's not a mess. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is really there's all of these leaders who brought us together in the manual therapy world and, and, and more, um, the movement science world, they, they brought genius and they brought a language. And that language over time becomes multiple languages, which confuses the entire group. So as an entry level tool, we've carefully teased out, get rid of special tests that we don't think are useful. Uh, delabel techniques so that they just make sense and can be documented and called what they are. And so Matt, Matt, that's something you and I could talk about further on, a, on, on either a, a get together call, but just know that what you can count on is that we are guideline based plus many of the other conditions that the guidelines don't cover. We have added in all the basic fundamental skills needed to examine and manage those problems. And actually to get to Matt's question about clinical reasoning, what I want to show you is that if you look at the simulations here, so I'm gonna take you through one of the sims. So I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller. Mini sims, which in some cases are five to 10 minutes long, these are short and they're short by design. I want students to enjoy playing them. I want students to apply some of their knowledge and complete the experience in a short period of time because I wanna hook them. I wanna hook them and tell them that you know valuable things and you can successfully navigate simple scenarios. So let's take range of motion, for example. We've made a simulation for each body region because again, it's not like students have tons of time. So for example, if you go to the shoulder game, you will see, let me make this a little bit smaller here and move us over, you'll see that there is a brief description. This is a shoulder game. They don't know what range of motion they're supposed to be looking at. The educator is able to see what this game is about, shoulder flexion. The educator is also able to see the entire game, which is one of my pet peeves related to Sims. I don't want to invite my students to play a game that I don't know what the story is and I don't know what the, the ending is. I don't want to have to deal with with questions that I don't know, I didn't, you know, I didn't write. So we purposely put in the key so that you could click through quickly. And I can make this a little bit bigger for you. So that I can click through quickly the entire simulation, look at the questions, look at what's going to happen in the game. So I'm going to play this game for you real quick, just so you can experience it. But I want you to know that the game, the, the key is there and it shows you like, the students are asked to place the axis of rotation, to place the stationary arm, the moving arm, and this is where they're supposed to place it. So there's a lot of little interactive ways for us to tease out their learning and allow them to apply it in a clinical setting. So let me show you that real quick. So I'm gonna open the game up. Note that I am logged in. Whatever happens in this sim is being recorded because my students will turn it in for course points, small course points, but I wanna reward them. And essentially I want to encourage them playing these little games. So here's, here's the patient saying, hey, I'm having problems bringing my arm up to my steering wheel. I'm having a hard time washing my hair. How am I supposed to drive? And so we asked the student, hey, based on the things that the patient's having problems with, what direction of movement should you measure to match his aggravating factors? So there's, it's just complicated enough to tease their brain a little bit. 
So they're going to say, oh, I think driving is shoulder flexion. Great. Okay. So let's watch this patient perform his aggravating movement. Sure enough. Yes. Perfect. I am correct. I want to assess flexion. Drag a box to the right, cor uh, correct location. So I'm going to go here, mid axillary line, lateral epicondyle. Right? I'm teasing knowledge out of their brain. I think they want this kind of thing. Where's the axis of rotation? So let's set up the patient. Axis of rotation, moving arm, stationary arm, submit. Great, now let's line up the goniometer to the right location. Let's go here. And now you have to read the darn thing, which is the hardest part. So we ask them to take a look. What is the range of motion that you found? This is closer to 85 degrees. Oops, it must be 105, sorry. And then, According to uh, the Academy, the AOS, what is the normal shoulder flexion range of motion? So let's just put 180 here. Great, here is a quick review. And the game is now over. You passed 80% or higher. The students have the option to click review and look through all the things that they missed or they can retry and play the game until they get 100%, okay? What happens after that, so let me close the key here, is there is a learning record. You can see how much time how they've spent on each sim, how their scores have progressed, what dates they did this, and what the students turn into me is just a simple learning report. It gives me the highest score, their highest score that they got. It gives me a record of their last five attempts. It allows me to see who did it, what sim is it, when they did it, or when this was issued. And I can also verify, verify this. So this is what I get to see as an instructor if I just want to double check that no one's messing around and screenshotting their name onto a learning report. We have sims like this for all the range of motion, all the MMT, and whenever you come to any of the other webinars, I will show you, you can explore neuro, acute care, physical agents, ortho, wound care, range of motion MMT. We've just released a whole slew of sims related to assisted devices. Um, there are so many ways for you without you having to do the work to create these, we have triple vetted them because I'm very scared of releasing things that are wrong. So we spend tons of money and time to build these for you because we know students want to learn this way. Any questions or comments about the simulations? And then I'll show you the last thing for today, which is the Surface Anatomy Palpation app. So let me just pause for a second. Thoughts or comments about the simulations? Here's a question in the chat, Mike, you may want to look at real quick because it's longer than I can summarize. Yeah, this is about tennis elbow. Yeah. And while you're reading that, um, uh, Matt, I think you asked earlier about, you know, clinical application stuff. And so here's where the Sims, I wrote earlier in the chat that Mike would get to probably the Sims part. And so hopefully that answers your question that was earlier in the chat, Matt. Yeah. And then Beverly, thanks for your comment as well. You know, I think what an instructor has to do, this is something that I, I was always thinking about shortly after I finished my education, my instructors had done a great job of sharing with me lots of different philosophies of how practice is done and how you can do things. Part of the, the, the challenge with that is I didn't feel like there was any one pathway I knew how to choose. I was just confused by all the possibilities. So I promised myself as an instructor that I would do my best to give clear direction on how to practice. So if you think about an orthopedic clinician, there's so many ways that you, so many influences that we have, but I would use the clinical practice guidelines as the way, and then I would make it clear how they should manage someone with related back pain or adhesive capsulitis. 
it would be very clear. When it comes to teaching and learning, I believe a, a professor has a job to be clear about how you learn. And I tell the students when it comes to skills, it's through multiple exposures. Your mission is to expose yourself to the techniques first, try them out if, if you can, and then when we come to lab, we'll practice them together. That is, I tell that at the beginning of my course, ortho. This is how you're gonna learn motor skills. So I think clarity is so important for students. So some direction. The second part I say is, when I ask you to do a sim, I expect that you are going to try your best and do it until you are satisfied with the, your clinical reasoning. They need to know that I value that this is an important step to their development as a clinician. And I believe that there must be consistency from a faculty member. There is a sim for you to play at the end of every week. There is a modality sim for you to play at the end of every week. There will be an ortho sim for you to play at the end of every week. I mean, it's a, it's a tall order for us to build all of these and we are doing it. You'll, you've, you'll be able to explore a lot of those. Um, so let me go back. Iman, I'm gonna answer that a little bit later related to tennis elbow because I think that's more orthopedic related. But I just want you to know that the way that, let me show you one, a couple of other things that are related to what I've just talked about. As a faculty member, so if I go into the range of motion MMT app, so I'll go here. You have the ability to augment your lab handouts. There's a couple ways to do it. Let's say you go to the range of motion and you're like, I already have a lab handout. I just wanna add PhysioU videos to it. What I would do is I would open the sidebar. Educators have this option available to them. So I copy the page title with link. I open my document, my lab handout. So you can see lab handout, syllabus or lecture. I put command V, the title and the hyperlink are already there. That's all you need to do. Now PhysioU videos are linked to your lab handout. The students have to have their own sus subscription. That's what supports us in what we're building. But every student now has the ability to click on that link and watch the video ahead of time. The other thing that you can see is that there is a copy thumbnail image. This, when you copy that, it says copy down here. I go back to the document, command V, it automatically drops the picture that is matching to the PhysioU app. So what you've just done is turned your lab handout into a visual learning tool with video hyperlinked in there. You can do the exact same thing for any one of the simulations. So if you're like, I, wanna, I want you at the end of this week to do this particular range of motion sim, shoulder A. I copy the page title with link. I throw it into your syllabus. Every student that clicks on that will get taken directly to the sim that they need to play. And they know that they need to download the learning report and turn it in for their, you know, for their course points. So that's one of the things I want to show you how easy it is to leverage the entire PhysioU library and augment your lab handouts and your lectures. So I put a lot of these videos into my lectures so that whether a student is, if I have 10 students stuck at home in quarantine, whenever I'm doing a lecture face-to-face -face or lab face-to-face, -face, I have Zoom going and I have all of my techniques linked. So I can click on my lab handout the students are watching the video, the same video that they're watching in class, they're watching at home. It has, it has relieved so much of my stress trying to manage too many cameras, trying to teach the students in front of me, trying to teach, teach to the students on Zoom. This gives you infinite flexibility by being able to link these videos to your lab handouts. So that's, that's one of the things. I also want to show you that under Again, on this sidebar, under the educator resources, there's complementary resources. So if you go down, this takes you to the website, you'll see, of course, all the other webinars that are coming up. But here under teaching content, there are lab handouts. The lab handouts, we've created lab handouts for the most generic classes where we know most people teach it the same way. So if you go to range of motion MMT, you'll see shoulder. Here is a shoulder document. 
you can download this and modify it if you want. Everything here is hyperlinked. So if I go back here and I click on the PDF, you'll see that our students know that they are going to palpate all of these structures on their own. And as long as they click on the picture, it will take them directly to the video. So this lab handout will include, you know, palpation, all the range of motion. So you'll see this is still all palpation here. Here's all the range of motion testing, all the MMT testing, all of it's here already created for you. So again, it's a doc, it's a document that you can download and modify. We're just happy to share it and not have every faculty have to reinvent the wheel. There are lab handouts that cover everything from physical agents, every single test you're going to teach in neuro, cardiopalm exam and treatment, assisted device fitting, gait training, transfers, bed mobility, all of it's there created for you, ready to go. Okay, the last thing I want to show you as I know we're running short on time, um, let me just show you back into the app here. I think I just want to show you this because it ties in very nicely with the range of motion MMT time period when this class is taught. So if I go back to our apps here, you will see at the bottom, surface anatomy palpation. So I was just in touch with Patty Nelson. She's a professor uh, in Texas. Um, and she has some introductory concepts, introduction to palpation and therapeutic touch. These are asynchronous mini lectures that you can just have students watch on their own. Okay, so it's a couple minutes there. What's really cool about what she's done is if you go to body region, you will see that she has bony, soft tissue, and TMJ. So let's take a look at soft tissue. There is an overview video of her palpating all the key structures in the anterolateral neck. You can go watch the entire overview, or you can go and look at each individual muscle. You can cut to the chase, meaning. So here is the muscle. Here's SCM. And then here's her palpation video. She has drawn onto the patient all of these key structures. The sternocleidomastoid muscle creates neck flexion when operating bilaterally, and it creates contralateral rotation and ipsilateral side bending. It's very prominent on the anterior part of the neck, and you can follow its margins down to the clavicular head here, which is quite broad, and then the sternal head, which is much smaller, that attaches to the manubrium. So she has basically drawn all of these structures onto the patient. This app will cover bony landmarks, they will cover soft tissue structures, and they will also cover many of the nerve entrapments many of the nerve entrapments as well. So she talks through all of it. It's all done for you. We will be releasing a worksheet. She has created a few different worksheets. I can show you an example here where we ask the students to palpate different structures. They just check it off, check, 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 check. And then there's some clinical mini cases. They may not know anything yet about piriformis syndrome, but it's the development right? It's the development of the pattern. It should begin in gross anatomy and surface anatomy palpation. It should begin in ortho, you know, in range of motion MMT. This worksheet is almost done. And then we will just post it as, as basically uh, surface anatomy palpation worksheets. So you'll have a worksheet for each body region that students will be able to go through and systematically learn to palpate these structures. That is a little bit about what the Surface Anatomy Palpation app is like. Um, any comments or questions? So this, you know, this app covers pretty much all your common soft tissue structures for all the different regions. Here are soft tissue structures for the shoulder, posterior shoulder, and she talks through all of them. 
I had a quick question on that. So in um, the teaching content uh, link, yep. there's not the palpations embedded into the range of motion and manual muscle testing. Is there going to be, are there going to be like separate handouts for the yes. surface palpation? Correct. That walk them through it? Yes. So, so when we released range of motion MMT about five years ago, the only palpation we had, systematic palpation, was embedded in the range of motion MMT app. And then when I met with Patty and I said, Patty, we need to bring this to all the schools because it's so unique the way you've drawn the muscles in. We will have a kind of a lab handout that is hyperlinked to and ask the students. It's like a worksheet, really. And the worksheet invites the student to palpate all of these structures. You could literally deploy the worksheet in your classroom. So it, it will look a lot like this. So here is posterior shoulder structures. And we have hyperlinked a bunch of these things. And so students will get together in lab. They will start palpating and checking off these boxes. Wherever we have videos, so we have videos for most of these, they can click on that link and directly go to that portion of the app. And then there's little cl clinical mini cases so the students can discuss and kind of palpate structures that are relevant to this axillary nerve palsy problem or this infraspinatus tendinopathy. So you can see again that philosophy of creating clinical context, which all of it begins to build and helps make the leap from some of these early fundamental classes to the very clinical pattern-based um, orthopedic and neuro classes, cardiopulmonary classes. We're trying to build that soft scaffold early. So I, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I was thinking more in the sense of like, um, I know the ones that I use are basically like, you know, start at this location, travel in this direction, feel for this kind of handouts. Yes. Will they be that detailed or is it more the worksheets where it's like, find this? We, yeah, for ahead. the palpation app, I think actually, let me open it and double check. Right now we have not built, we've only built it as worksheets um, because the app itself, if I go back to the app itself, let me just take a look. So if I go back to palpation, the instructions for palpation are all here. Um, we can build that. If that's useful to you, we can build that. Um, a, a lab handout for each body region, which has this in, these instructions and the hyperlink and a picture. I, I, is that what you're looking for, Liana? Yeah, essentially. Um, and if it's right there, then, you know, th that's easy access for them. But I know some like to have it in you paper know, physically. Yeah, a physical piece yeah. that they can look at as they're going through. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, this would be another easy one for us to build. I'll probably have the team spend some time thinking about how we would want to lay that out. But I suspect it would just be shoulder region, soft tissue, and then by body region, here's your structures, a picture and a hyperlink. So it would functionally be the same as the app, except that it could be a hand, handout that's just embedded into your LMS that students can download. And thank you. And then an, another kind of quick question. So she has already drawn it. So she's not drawing as, um, no. as she goes. That's do right. you feel like, I just haven't looked at them enough to know, do you feel like if I were to have my students try to draw that, that based on her videos, they would be able to do that? Or do you think it's it's more just um, using it to facilitate her demonstration, if that makes sense. You know, it, I think it's an issue about time. Um, I know that the students do a lot of the drawing of these structures in gross anatomy. Um, if you feel like you have the time and the student wants to draw that on each other, then I think there's nothing better than for the kinesthetic learner to do, do these types of things, you know, origin, insertion, you know, palpate the muscle belly. Um, I just, I think it's primarily a, do you have time in your class to do such things? So I, I don't know, I, would be, I think this is just open to the entire group um, as well. I think it's more of a time thing. I think inherently it makes sense to allow them to draw structures. Um, it's probably primarily a time issue. Because if you think about it, if you're like, let's palpate these structures, and in their mind, they can see, okay, that's where it is. This is what it looks like. Here's her walking through the origins and insertions and palpating. In you know, 12 seconds, 17 seconds, they're done. So this is a five minute palpation lab. 
that's how efficient it can be. Yeah, and that's one of the the main draws that I love is that they're short um, and and they don't you know take up unnecessary time uh, for the students, especially in so the program that I'm in is accelerated, and so we don't have a ton of time to be doing um, you know stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so I like these for that reason. My previous experience has been like having them go through and draw everything, but you know pros and cons to each. So I was just. It was more along the lines of if they watch this, can they draw? If I ask them to draw it, should they be able to? But it, it, it you know, it doesn't lead them through that. Um, so it might be more something we do in our in-person labs. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't lead them through the drawing component. Yeah, but it's nice to see the drawings. I mean, that that's a big bonus for them. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Mike, um, there was a question early in the chat, and I deferred it till the end here because typically just when you cover it, and that is um. Uh, subscription rate, subscription, yeah. how do they subscribe and stuff like that. And then it's funny because, you know, I, I old school like me, that will replace this uh, surface palpation anatomy at the drawing. I remember me on a skeleton with TheraBand holding up and having the guy rotate his head left or right and go, okay, it's getting longer or shorter. And and this makes it so much easier. And I remember me and a colleague doing that. And uh, Leanna, I think, you know, we've had demonstrations in lab at school where, you know, the students came in, have to do a certain muscle and they'd come in, they're already painted on and they demonstrate that muscle. The next guy would have the next muscle or something like that. And so they almost did like at the break before class to come in and then they'd take off their sweats and, oh, there's your rectus femoris <laughs> already painted on. It was, you know, that way they could yeah. do it without, without wasting time in lab. But it means they just got, it's on their own time though. And they well, got you know, on that note, James, I would say Mark Bishop um, and I sat at CSM for an hour dreaming about the metaverse. So any of you faculty who, uh, who want to join us into the metaverse. <laughs> it's something that we're thinking about. Those are the kinds of things that probably could be done for the future. Um, in the end, we have to decide too, how expensive can education get? Our goal of building these apps was to reduce costs for students. Think about every class, almost every class that they're going to be studying for in PT school is in these apps. All the techniques, all the mini games, all the preparatory games that help them to access their knowledge. So um, in, in our program, we're slowly eliminating certain textbooks that we don't need anymore because that knowledge is better learned through video and they can read and they can watch the videos. So for the students, for the faculty who are wondering, students, either we the, the faculty requires it. In our program, we, we require it from the first day of school. They're starting to use it in gross anatomy, range of motion, MMT and it follows them all the way through the three years. So they just have a stability of the resource, right? How do you get students to access a resource? You use it a lot, you teach them what's in it and how to use it, and you keep it in their pocket for the entire three years. You don't grab a new textbook, read a little textbook, and then put it away and hope that they'll access it later. So um, essentially we, you know, at $219 for three years, You've really just cost, it's just two textbooks, the cost of two textbooks. So our students, um, most programs have the students buy it themselves. So you just put a link into your syllabus. You just go to physiou.health, go to student, and you'll come to this page. The other thing that schools are doing is they will have us work with a bookstore. They'll make it a requirement. And the bookstore then the, we work with the bookstore so the students can buy it through the bookstore and use their financial aid. The third version is faculty have just placed this cost into a course fee. They know that they're going to use these apps in almost every course, right? If you think about all your neuro content, all your acute care content, PEDS, basic patient care, uh, you know, cardiopalm, there's so many apps in here that they're going to utilize throughout the entire curriculum that it's just embedded as a course fee. So if you have questions about how to do that, either with your bookstore or to work with us to make sure that it's embedded as a course fee. So the university buys all of it. They just send us a check. We send 57 codes to the, to the school and the school distributes the codes at the beginning of the year and the students all have it. You don't have to worry whether some are using it, some don't have it, some are sharing codes. We just know that the students having this on their phone all the time means that they can access this information all the time. 
So I hope that answers that question. Any other comments, questions? Any other thoughts or comments or questions? Well, I just want to invite you to uh, next week's Faculty Friday. It's at 9 a.m. In general, I'm, I'm say, telling people it's about 45 minutes because we now have Sims to talk about. And I always want to walk faculty through the Sims so they feel comfortable and familiar. And it makes it so much easier for you to de deploy in class. So feel free to join us next Friday. And um, James and I are not in a rush. Um, thank you for those of you who have joined us today. This video will be sent to you, this recording, so that you can share it with colleagues or watch it again. Um, and they're also commonly posted. So if I put it here under, if I go back to faculty resources, so here under at our website, under educator, faculty resources, there is watch webinar on demand. So a lot of these lectures that I've given they're all here that you can come and watch depending on key areas that you want to see, or you can always come to some of our live webinars. So thanks, thanks everybody for, for being here. Um, James and I are here just to field questions and get comments. So any thoughts, comments? In the chat, Rogan, I wanna reiterate there's Mike's meeting schedule. 